Welcome to the last reading in this, our 15th season of the Milwaukee Poetry Series. I'm Tom Hogan, the coordinator of the series. And we are very happy that you're here with us. We know that there's a lot of demands on your time and a lot of available things to do, and we appreciate you spending the time with us. I want to make some thanks first. Thanks to the city of Milwaukee who have supported us from the beginning. Thanks to the Letting Library who has also supported us from the beginning. We have a committee, thirdly, thanks to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. I think you've heard me say that we really don't have a thing like this happen unless there are a group of people working on it. So thanks to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. And finally, thanks to Willamette Falls Media. We are here at Willamette Falls Media. There's four of us here in the studio. Two of our readers will be reading from the studio. We also have two of our readers who are on Zoom and who will be reading from their home in Corvallis. So thanks to everything that Willamette Falls Media does, and especially to our technician tonight, our guru, Josh Reynolds. He's the one that's responsible for making all of this happen. Tonight is a special tribute reading to our friend and poet, Ann Stale. Ann was scheduled to be the reader, to be the uh, read, in, read November. in November originally. And she wanted to change to July. She had a treatment that she was very positive about, and she wanted to try that. So instead of in November, as was originally planned, we changed that reading to July. Uh, as we know, and lost her battle with cancer. So tonight is the reading that she would have read July 13th, and we are doing a tribute reading to her. Let me tell you a few things about, about Anne. She is an educator and a poet. In 1971, she began writing and teaching literature at Hedrick Junior High School in Medford, and later at high schools at Ashland, Josephine County, and Tuloma during her 40-year career. Later, she worked with teachers in training at Western Oregon University, Oregon State University, and Willamette University. Her longest and most satisfying tenure was the two decades she spent teaching with the Northwest Writing Institute and Lewis and Clark College. There, she taught classes such as visual thinking, William Stafford Studies, and Still Life. She also spent nine consecutive summers teaching with Bard College's Institute for Writing and Thinking, and Dale on Hudson, New York. She earned three master's degrees, Master's of Art and Teaching, Master's in Humanities, Master's in Leadership and Policy Analysis from Stanford University. She was a publicist, published an essayist and a poet, and edited both poetry and fiction. Her first two books of poems, Primary Sources, 2011, and Instructions for the Wishing Light, 2013, were published by Book Trope Editions, Seattle, where she was also the poetry editor. She later independently published Afternoon Sky, Hardy Desert, in three small collections. Her last collection, Spirit and Moves in All Things, will be published posthumously. She was also a writer in residence at the Island Institute, Sitka, Alaska. Tonight, for our tribute reading, we have four featured readers. Would you join me in welcoming our first featured reader tonight, Linda Gilbert. Thank you, Tom. What, a, what an absolute pleasure to get to do this tonight. Um, to think about Anne in this special way by reading her words. I would have first mentioned that I, I met Anne in 1997 when I attended a writing workshop that she and Jane Blazer led from the Corvallis Benton County Library. This was the first of many workshops and classes I took from her over the years. In 1997, I was not writing poetry. I wasn't thinking much about poetry, but uh, something happened uh, at that time. I had the honor and pleasure of serving with Anne and Paul Ann and Salima on the board of the Friends of William Stafford. 
and delighted in the times we carpooled the meetings together and got to know one another better, as you do when you sit together in a car for 90 minutes. I enjoyed dreaming up poetry events with her, planning and publicizing them. When I think of Anne, I think about the poet, the muse, a friend with casual elegance. You never forget the twinkle in her eyes, her easy smile, her laughter, and her words. Her poetry, often sensual, especially visual, takes us by surprise at times or, or simply sits with us and a cup of tea or coffee and reminds us of the preciousness of long stemmed flowers outside the window or the breeze or this very moment. The last full stanza of a poem of hers, What is Poetry, was published in the Corvallis Advocate during Poetry Month last year. This is how that stanza reads. I have often compared a poem to steam rising from a hot cup of coffee or the shape-shifting form of clouds, the mesmerizing fire's flame, the empty spaces between words, the negative space surrounding the poem, the pauses during a conversation, that intake of breath as the comet passes, what we see from the corner of our eyes. So this is from the poem, What is Poetry? And an interesting question to use as a prompt for writing. So it's an honor and a privilege again to share a few of her poems this evening. And I'm going to start with the poem, Poetry in a Time of War. This is in the book, Small Beauties. This is for the soldiers, for the peacemakers. This is what we're doing, isn't it? Ignoring the generals and their advisors, substituting fresh asparagus for drones. We've gathered to write and share a small circle encircled by other circles. In this town, veterans for peace and the National, Regard, and the National Guard unit returning from a 13-month deployment. In this town, those planning a fall festival, those filling care packages, cigarettes, cookies, socks for the troops. I applaud our presence with opposing views, without guns. This is what our country stands for. Not big business, not cop corporations as persons, not big oil and gas. We bend our heads as though in prayer, in prayer. We make our thinking visible on the page, our memories, hopes, and, and desires visible, Silence and words create this sacred space where we know and can be known in a time of war. Another poem from the book Fire in the Desert is Above Me the Day Blind Stars with thanks to Wendell Berry. Our discussion has made me tearful near weeping and the job of the poet, my job and yours, is to remind others who are also struggling of the absolute presence of our better selves. The selves who don't want to carry guns, who are loved and respected by parents, our own children, our students. Joy and optimism are not just our better selves, but our truest and deepest selves. Everywhere in the world, good people outnumber those who hate and kill. The young woman who lived through Parkland and 20 years later on its anniversary kills herself, swamped by the pain of an experience she could not resolve. She needed to be surrounded by people who knew what poets know. There is peace and healing in the natural world, in that little park down the street with the man who grows roses in the desert, in the sound of moving water, in the day blind stars. Another book, excuse me, another poem in the same book, 
fire in the desert is wandering spirit. And this is a prose poem. When your spirit returns from wandering the earth, you must speak to her in a particular way, looking intently into her eyes with the tone of voice you'd use with a beloved child, with a friend near death. Do not cry, but listen to your heart whisper what you must say with gentle kindness, with all the wisdom you've acquired during your life. Say, tell me more. Then listen for the unspoken question. After this, what happens next? Maybe heaven is a dark green painted bench where you sit with your beloved grandfather who died 50 years ago. A Catholic who didn't announce his religious beliefs, but walked through the world with endless kindness, curiosity, and his golf bag. Tell him how much you've missed him. Hold his hand. Never let it go. And finally, again from the same book, Fire in the Desert, the poem transformed. And um, this is going to be probably a personal poem for at least one person here in the group that's joining us in the reading. Transformed for my Tuesday writing group. We are transformed by wonder. Also by love, failure, by hope and healing, by loss, and by what we win or lose. We are transformed by reading, by gardening, by singing. It is impossible not to be transformed every day unless you are numb, unless you choose not to be. When Frank laughs, when Marilyn remembers the paper bag at the doorway and her friend who reads the message too, when Steve recalls his mother painting, how her aging tremors disappeared. Montana and her grandfather altered Alice's life. And when she recounts the story, she alters mine. When JT lists all his doctors and counts his blessings, he alters my heart too. All of you and far away friends, William Stafford, Virginia Woolf, Sappho, Emily with her words and dashes, all of this transforms me. Poems by Anne Staley. It's an absolute delight to get to read. Thank you so much, Linda. How lovely. Would you join me in welcoming our second featured reader tonight, Salima Malzi? Thank you. It is it is a delight to be here under different circumstances would be a lot more acceptable to me, but it is a delight to be here and to, to honor my dear and long friend, Anne Staley. Um, I've thought a lot about her today, as I'm sure we all have. And um, I'm going to read several of her poems, ones that describe her as the person I knew. Gentle, kind, those of you that saw the photograph that accompanied the uh, invitation to tonight's reading, um, caught that impish look. That, that's our Anne, impish. And funny and sweet and very, very dear. Um, I didn't know her as long as uh, Paul Ann, for instance, and probably not nearly as long as Jerry and, and Linda either. Um, but I knew her well and I loved her much. So the first poem I want to read is called Conversation with a Potter. And it's from those early days when I didn't know her. It was the 70s. 
I lived in the country in a refurbished hay barn. With my grandmother's inheritance, I purchased a wood stove, a monoprint by my friend, the art teacher, a copper kettle. My neighbor on Frank Hill Road was a, poet, was a potter who threw beautiful bowls and teapots, complete sets of dinnerware and soft blue glazes. Always attracted to artists and musicians, I admired his work. One afternoon, as I watched appreciatively, he looked up from the circling wheel, smiling, and said without a moment's thought, that you are an artist too, Anne. Every day, look at how you live. <laughs> Every day, look at how you live. I think about our writing sessions in Corvallis when we would approach the, the little house on 8th Street with the blueberries blooming along the sidewalk and we'd grab a few handfuls and munch on them as we gathered in the kitchen and, and then in the living room uh, where we would conduct the business of the day. One of the things that I really loved about Anne was, was the nuanced humor that was always there, always there. Um, and I think it's reflected in this, um, in this poem that is prompted by, um, in her other writing group, apparently by Steve. It's called Love's Alphabet. And the instruction is to name one thing you love, says Steve. Apples, liberty. And ace, bedtime, boxers, the shoes and the dog, the cats, old cars, chapter emails, and court. Several Davids, dusting, DC, errands crossing off the list, and my editor, fabric stores specialty ones like Pendleton or run-of-the-mill stores like Joann's and friends, the long, lifelong like Kathy and Sisu or brand new like Bob, whom I met yesterday. Granola, giraffes and gingerbread, hot dogs with mustard and a baseball game, icicles, Ian and jam. Knitting needles set up with Angora yarn, lemons and lemonade, music and maple leaves tinged with frost, NPR all the time, my niece, my nephew, and 8th Street neighbors, river otters, maybe in my next life, Progress Elementary, the peace sign, the post office, the quick and the chaotic. The romantics, a romantic, any river, nighttime stars and sky, soap suds, S R, tomatoes in late August, Thanksgiving, the unflappable, Valentine's on any day, white wine and writing. There must be something besides the xylophone, an unwelcome noise, maybe a flower or a bird, a scientific name. Xanthip, I'll let you look that one up. And yellow. Zurich, indeed, all of Switzerland in any season. Loves alphabet. I have learned the litany of my life, the pattern of repetitions, responsibilities, and delights. 
I have learned more than I ever wanted to know. Dream back into innocence, life clean of regret, the sky cloudless. Yet today reels me in, and what remains, a crumb on the cutting board, the rain-glazed cherry tree in a neighbor's garden, pale winter light is cause for celebration. Even my hungry mouth cannot ask for more than this. My heart beating in its cage, my hands opening. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salima. Impish. I loved hearing about gulping blueberries. And you talked about her nuanced humor, which was always there, and the litany of my life. So, Salima, thank you very much for being here, for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. We appreciate it. Our third featured reader tonight will be again from Corvallis. Jerry Elliott Otto is a writer and freelance editor who lives at the edge of a forest outside Corvallis. She writes regularly with several long-running writing circles on Zoom these days. That is the case, isn't it? Currently, she is helping to edit a new collection by Anne, The Spirit That Moves in All Things, poems that Anne gathered before her death and intended to be published posthumously. Would you join me in welcoming our next featured reader tonight, Jerry Elliott Otto. Jerry. Yeah, I, I met Anne I'd, close to 30 years ago. I don't know exactly when. And um, a friend of mine who uh, was a writer and probably Anne from her work at Fireweed, uh, Melissa Medensky, some of you may know her, um, recommend that I get in touch with Anne. And I found that she was teaching a class through our community college, Lynn Benton Community College, which I took. And in that class, uh, Anne invited me into the room and to all the writing that was going on there. I was immediately assured by her warm voice and impressed by her vitality and confidence and her elegance and grace. She was this very tall, graceful, lovely person. And there was an immediate, an immediate uh, feeling of her presence and intelligence and generosity and sureness in her approach as a teacher, which I know many of her students um, who kept in contact with her for many, many years uh, enjoyed um, that same approach. Uh, she included me in that class, regarded me as a fellow writer, and seemed to believe in me and in all of us writing. She believed that we had something to say, and that by writing it, we might discover what that is. And through sharing it, we could cry and honor each other and our thoughts. Um, so that was when we first met. From there, Anne and I wrote in many groups over those 30 years um, together, starting in her living room on Wednesday nights. Um, sometimes people wrote essays, sometimes they wrote poetry, but uh, she always welcomed us in and um, offered us tea and refreshments in that lovely, peaceful space and each other's fine company. Um, so all of those groups where four or five or eight 
writers, that circles that gathered together and dissolved and evolved with friends dropping in and dropping out as our lives changed. But uh, there was something always going on and uh, a lot of our time together was spent in the cars, driving back and forth from place to place or going to a museum to write about the museum and, um, and just had uh, an enriching relationship for me. And I appreciate and miss Anne very much. So, um, I'm going to uh, make a few remarks before I reading just that um, maybe you have heard Anne's six word biography. It, it was loves this world, pen in hand. Anne connected just about everything to her writing. With Anne, writing was an exercise in noticing. She noticed life. She took it in with all her senses and remembering certain moments she wrote. Writing reflected her experiences, her lived loves and losses, her human heartbreak, her sorrows, triumphs, disappointments, also the joys, the colors, the comforts and beauty of the world as it could be written from her understanding from her view in her words. Anne read widely and often deeply, a poem, an essay, a book, an article or research study, anything on any topic might be the start for a poem from Anne. But even a headline, a place name, a painting or photo, a New Yorker cover or cartoon, a song on the radio, or a sign on the side of the road might prompt her to take up her book and pen. The first poem I'd like to read is Sappho's latest from Primary Sources. I remember talking with Anne years ago about a news article about newly found bits of writing on papyrus believed to be poem fragments by the famed poetess Sappho who lived in the sixth century BC. Anne, the forever feminist, had this wry take on that discovery. This is called Sappho's Latest. And there is a reference near the end someone was asking me about, a reference to Charlotte. And Charlotte is the title spider from E.B. White's book, Charlotte's Web. <laughs> So Sappho's latest and the epigraph reads, for you, the fragrant bloomed muses, lovely gifts. 26 centuries later, we discover another poem on papyrus used as cartonage for some long dead Egyptian. 26 centuries later, you make the headlines in translation, two Anglo-Saxon men from Mars try to figure your Venusian message. Your latest has the usual accumulation of fragments. Violet, yes. Hair turning white. Fawn and lyre. The old question of agelessness. Tithonus and rose-armed dawn the goddess wife who will bury the gray aged man. It is ever thus, Sappho, men wondering what we mean, what we care about, even as they prepare for war. You saw it all, they say, and kept on with your poems on cloth, extant fragments, empty spaces awaiting bracketed conjecture enough mysterious language to ignite academy quarrels, enough to make your reputation. We wonder from our comfortable living rooms, 
pure water pouring from the tap with tie out electric lights, flypaper, what it was that made you write and know the answer is as full as bloodthirsty Charlotte's hunger, sex, and light. Now's attentive yearning, some zealous instinct for the everlasting. Um, next, I'd like to read uh, her poem, Portal from Instructions for the Wishing Light. And in the, I, I just, my remarks about that were that um, in a practice of insight meditation, the practitioner is invited to pay attention to exactly what is happening in their direct experience through the six sense doors of the body. The sense organs are the sense organs for seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching. Those are the five we learn in school. In this practice, the sixth is the mind as the portal for thinking. I imagine this poem as the settling of the mind, maybe even reflecting after a time of sitting in meditation. So this is portals. Pulled away from the patience of ordinary things, the tea kettle, the Howard clock, the maple trees in autumn. I take on the great emptiness, drawer by drawer, the great letting go of the unnecessary. Tomorrow there will be more of the same that 1960s skepticism, inbred caution, incessant busyness, chasing the next deep breath. The mystics say there are six portals of the senses, the, the dumb thoughts, clouds like a debris flow headed downhill toward water. I hold back at first, a cautious dreamer, a lapsed Catholic still counting sins. But if listening can reveal a poem, surely I can tell my friends from my adversaries, myself from my disguises. At the altar, divine light, sh shadows, walls that whisper, a vase of hydrangea sits beside one more empty page. And uh, my third poem that I'm going to read um, is one that I heard read to a mindfulness study group by the parent of one of Anne's former students. I didn't know he and Anne had that connection before he introduced the poem to offer it at the group as a sort of tribute to Anne as a fine teacher who was also an accomplished poet. I found his reading be quite touching as Anne was ill then and the poem seemed to express some of the riches available to us all in life. I didn't know then that he himself was and is facing a serious cancer diagnosis. The poem invited all of us who heard it to notice and appreciate what our lives offer us. This poem is called Gratitude. Gratitude for the new year, bright sky, bitter cold, for relentless rain and Pacific winds, the jet stream west of the coast that sets it all in motion, for the fog nurturing Sitka spruce, the downhill gradient moving the creek along, for the cabin Franz built and donated to us all, for brass knobs that turn and glass pulls, for daylights by the hundreds, 
for the political spectrum, for friends who no longer like me, for praise and forgiveness and wounds that heal, for the healers, for the unexpected arriving out of left field, the grounder the shortstop misses, that home run, for bicycles, for whomever invented them, and fire when necessary, for the strength abandonment teaches, for loyalty deserved and otherwise, for the surety of instinct and passion rekindled, for songs sung ours and old books sent by mail, for parents and children doing their best, brothers and sisters, cousins too, for the special aunt, the grandmother who knits and neighbors who care, for sinner and saint, the black sheep and the left dress, for golf course lamps and sunsets when the new titleist is forever, for desks and the silence that surrounds them, for the chorus from the bookshelf, cat and dogs and birds in flight, for the neighing pasture mare and the cornfield which, lo which she longs to graze, for the 21 lichen that purify our air and gravel roads in winter, for the post office sending our messages along, for beautiful steps on letters hand addressed, for gin and tonic, the limes too, for the historian, the poet, the choir director, believer in dreams, pesto basil, for basil pesto, warm garlic bread, for winter and three kind words, for a God we're questioning, counting on, and the goddesses waiting off stage, for blossoming cherry trees, for the sweet gum, the empty notebooks awaiting words, for music dreamed at night, the artist's first show, the off-off Broadway musical, for the architect's plan, the actor memorizing her lines, for the nuclear engineer teaching composition, for leaders, counselors, lawyers who must listen and hear, for safety guards, e-room nurses, first responders, for your favorite teacher and the substitute, and those who watch in darkness to bring the planes safely down, for the soldier missing home and those who await him, for a traveler stepping into the unknown, for the newborn and the elders, the wisdom of innocence and experience, for every new friend we make and the old friends who remember us, for reunions of every kind, your dearest love, the kindly heart, for joy, hope, hopefulness, the holy beginning and end. Poems by Anne Staley. Thank you. Thank you so much. Paul Ann Peterson, Oregon's Poet Laureate Emerita, has seven full length books of poetry. Most recently, One Small Son from Salmon Poetry in Ireland. From 2003 to 2009, she served with Anne on the board of Friends of William Stafford. Would you join me in welcoming our next featured reader tonight, Paul Ann Peterson.
Thank you, Tom. I first met Ann Staley in the 70s, 45 years ago. I think we're on now. <laughs> I did first meet Anne in the 70s, 45 years ago. Lucky me. Uh, Anne and I were in the same film class at Southern Oregon State College, now Southern Oregon University in Ashland. We sat next to each other in an auditorium there to see Metropolis, perhaps, uh, Nosferatu. During a break, we talked. I'd been reading Ana Is Nin and listening to a cassette tape of an interview with Nin. Anne told me, yes, she knew Nin's work, the famous Nin journals. Anne told me that she had corresponded with Ana East Nin. They'd exchanged a number of letters. To me, the housewife from Klamath Falls, the fledgling writer getting her degree so she could teach public high school, to me, this Anne Staley, correspondent with the world famous Ana East Nin, this Anne Staley was a rarefied, exotic creature. Not pretentious, no. But she did have a kind of East Coast refinement that I'd learned to recognize when I was at Pomona College in the 60s. An elegance, a polish, a savoir faire. So that hot Ashland summer school summer, I got to know the urbane, yet down to earth, the compassionate, the remarkably talented writer and teacher, Anne Staley. Pure delight. But because she was in Corvallis and I was in Klamath Falls then, it wasn't until I moved back to Portland in the 90s that our paths began to cross again frequently. I began organizing the January William Stafford birthday events all over Oregon, and Anne was often featured in them. Later, we served together, we worked together from 2003 to 2009 those were the years that Anne was on the board. We were on the board together of Friends of William Stafford. We even taught together occasionally. One year, she invited me to team teach with her, a class on Stafford's Every War Has Two Losers, a class offered through the Northwest Writing Institute at Lewis and Clark College. Oh, what a privileged experience for me to teach with Anne. Through the years, Anne frequently sent me beautiful broadsides of her poems, lovely gifts that I often displayed in my home so that other people could savor them too. This evening, in tribute to Anne, I'll read four of her broadside poems. I begin with a poem obviously inspired by a trip she took to Italy in 2011. Amore. Bees in the Daphne, pink blooms in Clematis, English ivy cascades castle walls. We wander inside the walled town, numbered doors, quiet voices. 
It is easy to be in love with this world and its inhabitants. The chubby Dalmatian, the grumpy post office clerk, the beggar outside the co-op, the bald man driving the yellow Mercedes. The sky is rain-ready gray. Faces are alive with light. Saint Paulino may be here or elsewhere. The angels are enough. Here's another that Anne titles Willamette Valley, Late March. Very much an Oregon poem. Willamette Valley, Late March. Winter rain in the Cascades. Days and nights of its arriving on Pacific winds as cool mist or piling up gunmetal clouds along the ridges. If you come to this western valley, prepare for wet blessings. Twenty-eight kinds of moss and lichen, rust, moisture-soaked ferns, puddles outside your doorway, a succession of umbrellas you lose and find and for lost and found days. You stay inside with a steaming cup and the book you've been meaning to read, the one your brother sent for last year's birthday. At night, when the cars and people settle, when the cats are sleeping on our laps and there is nothing, nothing you can do to avoid your life, the ghosts, the voices, your imperfect self, take comfort in the sound of rain, the great privacy of water falling, its belief in gravity, its faith in the hereafter. Here's Anne's poem titled, Stray Paragraphs in April, Year of the Red Monkey. And if you could see this poem on the page, you would certainly take note that each of Anne's stray paragraphs is only a sentence, one sentence long. Stray Paragraphs in April, Year of the Red Monkey. And this has the epigraph with thanks to Charles Wright. Only those who are living are able to die. The others are already in the great beyond. Voiceless without a word to say, deaf with the sound of Bach. Desire in its highest form, the cats sleeping entwined in the back bedroom. Two flowering azaleas steady Heartbeat after a decade, the cold of midwinter. Make of yourself a light, the Buddha said. But what kind of light? A lighthouse? A candle? A porch light? April is the cruelest month, said T.S. Eliot. 
the damp becomes emerald green. My soul is on fire. This fourth and last of my chosen Anne poems is a collage of statements and images entitled, Every Idea is a Star. At the end of this poem, Anne alludes to, she addresses a Gemini poet. A Gemini poet, June 1st, being Anne's birthday, she definitely is a Gemini poet. Every idea is a star. Along the wild rogue river, the night sky is confetti strewn across the dark. Friend Devon refused to sleep indoors. Dreams, he said, need starlight. When Rumi danced with his beloved near the fire, there was the sound of a flute, wine, glittering night above. At that eastern Oregon lake, she saw the three sisters' white flanks moonrise in a sparkling sky. On the evening, he discovered the peony star nebula. The river sang its song as we searched the sky with a telescope. Gold stars for superior work, silver one step below. Our teachers ranked us with the five-point star. The famous astronomer hosted Cosmos. Your light, Gemini poet does not vanish at dawn. Oh, Anne, you spoke such truth about yourself at the end of this poem, Every Idea is a Star, when you said, your light, Gemini poet, does not vanish at dawn. Your light, Gemini poet Anne Staley, truly does not vanish at dawn. Your light lives and shines at all times. In every one of your written words, your light is alive and shining. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Anne, thank you so much. The angels are enough. Rain ready gray. Take comfort. Make of yourself a light. And at the end, your light does not vanish at dawn. Thank you so much. Thank you, featured readers for being here. I am so happy and uh, pleased to be part of this tonight. Thank you for all of those who have been with us tonight for the live stream. This is recorded, so this is going to be on the Letting Library YouTube channel uh, for viewing on demand when people want. So thank you for all of your sharing and your poems you're talking about Anne tonight. It's just been, it's just been wonderful. I want to tell everybody that we do not have a reading in August. We do have First Fridays.
but we will be back in September with our 16th season. And our plan is to be in person. So that's September 14th, and we plan to be uh, in person. We're looking forward to that. So we hope to see you then. For the Milwaukee Poetry Series and our reading tonight, I'm Tom Hogan. Good evening. Good evening.